In our last episode of Raising the Digital Dead, I offered a bit of history surrounding the beginnings of Processor Technologies' SOL 20 terminal computer, which brought into existence the prototype of that machine, the SOL Intelligent Terminal. I also laid out an insane plan to actually try building a replica of that prototype, which I've been told by none other than Lee Felsenstein himself was a fool's errand. But as I said at the end of my video, sometimes it's not about the destination, but rather the journey, and I'm eager to lead this digital suicide charge. I'm just that kind of guy, I guess. Okay, so having decided to embark on this crazy project, where do we start? Well, to be honest, I kind of started this a few years ago, briefly. The genesis of actually attempting this project was my purchase some years ago of this Keytronic keyboard that an eBay seller thought had come from an 8080 based terminal similar to the one I proposed to build. I was looking at it one day and had a eureka moment when I realized the key shapes and arrangement of the keys matched something I'd seen before, the Sol Intelligent Terminal in Popular Electronics. Some of the keys obviously aren't the same color or have the same labeling, but otherwise they appear to be pretty much identical. Having the keyboard not only gave me a shot at making something that looked reasonably like the prototype, it also provided a crucial sense of scale. One thing I learned the hard way with my TV typewriter prototype project was not to trust photographs or even scans of things like artwork for scale. And here's why. Uh, here's an example of what I'm talking about. This is a scan of the original artwork for the TV typewriter from the construction guide that I found online when I was first setting out to do that project. At the time, I didn't have a real construction guide like this one. And so, I basically just took these and the problem here was there's no scale provided and that's because these are supposed to be at full size in the original construction guide. The problem is when you scan them, if you're not careful about how you do the scanning process, it can actually distort things in a way that is not easily correctable. Uh, and to explain that a bit, um, what I tried to do to guard against getting the wrong size was basically scale up because we know, you know, the size of different ICs that fit uh, on these IC pads here. So I figured if I just scaled all those correctly and all of them lined up and my chips physically fit, then it must be right, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, it turns out I was very wrong. Um, I did scale it correctly, every chip fit properly, and I went about two thirds of the way into building my first TV typewriter replica. And I discovered when I was installing the transformer for it that it didn't fit. And when I did a measurement, I realized, you know, something was not right. Um, a few months after I kind of came to a standstill, a fellow that I was talking to uh, for an eBay auction that I lost said, well, here's a consolation prize. I'll send you an original guide, which I was absolutely thrilled about. And this is great because now I know for sure what the scale is supposed to be. And I was able to take this um, and basically measure this against that and I discovered right away there was a significant difference and it wasn't just that it was out in a certain proportion it was actually like I don't know how to describe it, it was like skewed twisted it's like somebody put it through um, Adobe Photoshop and just sort of twisted all the dimensions around so yeah it ended up being not wide enough and not tall enough and so i basically ended up scanning this in as line art with a really high quality scanner that i have a, a microtech and basically that was the only way that i could assure that i had the right scale getting my hands on an original set of plans for the prototype design is probably pretty close to zero though only a handful went out before processor technology's new design came out Thankfully, one individual did get a copy and he scanned them for the benefit of others, which are now posted on the sol20.org website. They're messy and that's kind of scary, but at least I had something to work with and unlike the TVT plans, which were printed out at full size and thus without a scale, these have the actual dimensions printed on them. My plan is to print these off onto a transfer medium like magazine paper, iron them onto copper clad PCB stock and then etch. Yeah, I could design this whole thing in KiCad, but I really wanted to preserve the original artwork. All of these traces, the labelings, these were what were laid out by the designers themselves by hand. I feel like if I redo that process in modern PCB design software, I lose that admittedly tenuous connection to its creators. 
The next challenge is that the board itself is double-sided. I have made double-sided boards before, but I kind of cheated. I had scored some single-sided PCB stock that was half the thickness of the most commonly used copper clad. So basically I was able to use Photoshop to align and check the artwork for both sides of a given board, and then print off the artwork to be transferred for each side, iron each onto a piece of vintage PCB stock, align and bond together. The result for my Mark 8 project I thought looked pretty darn convincing. I'm a real stickler for details and having correct vintage looking PCB stock is very important to me. I've argued this out with various people and most inform me that the process used to make PCB substrate back in the 1970s is different than what it was today. If you look at substrate from the 1970s, you can see it usually has a fluorescent green color. Sometimes it's almost see-through, other times it gets kind of cloudy. It can also occasionally look yellowish brown. Vintage PCB substrate also often features manufacturer marks, like these little TCs that stand for Taylor clad, this M I think stands for mic apply, and this NOP stands for Norplex. These companies make the laminates that comprise the substrate, and I think they also affix the copper depending on customer demand. They also sold the plain laminates for various uses. The new stuff that you can buy from China, by contrast, often doesn't look anything like original vintage boards. It's usually a yellow or brown color, and it's often devoid of any manufacturer marks. It's also, I don't know how to describe it, smoother looking than the old stock? Now, you can get green colored PCB material today, but it's tricky because most PCB manufacturers don't really care about color, and often don't show the underlying substrate in their product photos or mention it with their descriptions. Most people buying PCBs today just don't care about that. I had to order from a few places before I found this greenish stuff more or less by accident, but you can see when it's next to the original, it's clearly not vintage, it's a totally different hue of green, and it's not really fluorescent or see-through. When I was experimenting with these for my TV typewriter and Mark 8 projects, before I found some vintage stock, I even went as far as trying to dye them to the correct color. That helped a little bit, but it was obviously wrong. The dye I used was sort of a blue jean kind of color, and I basically boiled everything in a pot. I ended up with something that kind of looked greenish, but it also kind of looked purple. My desire to get that perfect vintage look was saved when I found some vintage Synthane Taylor stock on eBay which not only looked correct, I mean, they were correct. They even had the production dates verifying that it was made in the time of those projects. Far out. Unfortunately, in this situation though, the boards simply aren't large enough. The Sol PCB is a tad bigger than the area of these boards, which are 8x12. The Sol board is actually 9x13. Bummer. I can keep searching for the appropriate material. I mean, there was lots of this stuff made and little bits of it show up now and again. Regardless, having to align the artwork properly and etch in one go is likely to be a huge challenge, fraught with mistakes. The power supply will be another issue, and may end up being the one place where I deviate from the original design and do something modern and relatively safe. There's no mention of the power supply design in the original Popular Electronics article. It was assumed if you were building something advanced like this, you already had a bench power supply or the knowledge to build your own. Of course, a crucial bit of business lies in acquiring parts. Now, fortunately, I've already got a few bits of what I need left over from my TVT project. Check out this bag of TVT parts. This is everything I acquired for that project that's just left over. I also have boxes of 7400 logic available. You know, I'm not going to be going for perfect authenticity here when it comes to the date codes on these chips. You know, it's one thing to search for chips that are produced before a certain date or produced after it, but to find it in a specific range, that's a little trickier. Basically, I just want to see if I can get something working, and then from there I might gradually swap in the date code correct stuff as I find it. Since the prototype was built in late 1976, we're most likely to see chips from the latter half of 1975, and maybe some early 1976 parts. Most of the chips are still reasonably common 7400 series logic, like I said, so yeah, I don't think we're going to have a problem finding them. However, like the TV typewriter, there are a few bits that add some hurdles. The prototype used three 5204 EEPROMs. These are still attainable, unlike the almost unobtainium shift registers the TV typewriter used. However, you can't just stick these into a modern EEPROM programmer. I'm told you need almost 60 volts for programming, and so you need a specific programmer which probably isn't available anymore. Some years ago, a brand new programmer kit was offered for these, but it's been a couple of years now and this may no longer be available. So that may end up being a project within a project, unless I can find someone with a burner. For the 8080 CPU and 2101 RAMs, I actually have it kind of easy. 
Remember those Paco parts I showed off in my previous unfridging video? Well, it turns out this is where these can come in handy. I'll probably never have whatever machine these boards went into, which is probably an industrial machine anyway. But thanks to them, I now have a couple of these boards with spare parts, which gives me a nice white ceramic 8080 CPU and just enough 2101 RAM chips to get going, possibly with some logic I also may need. For a tape deck, well, thankfully I have plenty of units that will look the part as I bought up some Fidex spares for my digital group machine, and whatever I use doesn't actually need to work anyway since no provision for tape was implemented with this version of the Sol PCB anyway. There is one other item to contend with, but let me cover the case next as it will lead into that. Making a replica of the prototype's case was always going to be a challenge. I'm not intimidated by cutting wood or anything, I did lots of that with my TV typewriter prototype replica. There's also the bent acrylic or plexiglass cover here, and of course there's some structural metal which, for the moment, I could only assume was there but couldn't see. Yeah, I wasn't too worried about finding the components really, but sizes and design, especially for parts I couldn't physically look at, that's a problem. How am I going to figure out the correct dimensions for everything, unless I let go of my desire to make it look like the original? I pondered that for months, and for a while it almost seemed to be a showstopper. The TV typewriter prototype was at least theoretically accessible via the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. And by the way, museums don't just serve the purpose of letting the public gawk at artifacts, they also actually try to help out with research. And CHM staff were more than willing to help supply the measurements of Don Lancaster's original machine. That proved to be invaluable as it allowed me to deduce some elements of the unit's construction that were not immediately obvious from available photos. However, with the Saul prototype we had a problem. The prototype wasn't in a publicly accessible museum available to be photographed and measured. It was still in Bob Marsh's possession. The last time the prototype had been seen in public, and the only time it had been photographed in color, was at one of the first vintage computer festivals in the late 1990s. A helpful VC Fed member pointed me to an archive of a long defunct website that featured those pictures, but as was the case with digital photography and websites in general back then, the quality was pretty poor. Having some color helped, but ascertaining dimensions of the unit from those grainy pictures, any kind of detail really, was almost impossible. At that moment in time, I had no choice but to try and guesstimate it. Using my keyboard as a reference for dimensions, as well as a tape deck that I knew to be roughly the same size as the one used by processor technology, I began to ferret out the rough dimensions of the unit, mindful that the magazine's imperative to fit things on the page had likely produced some weird distortions. I thought the keyboard and cassette deck, since they were placed fairly close to the inside edges of the case, would guard against making it too wide. For the very first time in my replica building career, I decided to actually build a full-scale model out of cardboard. This would allow me to stage components, compare to photos, and get a sense of whether I was on the right track. I didn't go too fancy, I figured I'd be ripping this thing apart or cutting it down many times, making adjustments to try and get as close to the look of the original as possible. But I did use some spray paint to make it blue and blend it together a little bit better. And this was the end result. Uh, yeah, it's been sitting in storage for a while and getting beaten up by things that got piled onto it, but uh, yeah, I kind of put it back together here. I think I got pretty close for a first try with such bad photos, but there were still some questions the photos couldn't answer. Like, was there a bend in the upper part of the acrylic? Uh, how tall was the unit? You know, I'd gone with pure guesswork there. I actually reached out to Bob Marsh himself on this one, peppering him with questions. He was very gracious and replied, but his memory after 40-something years wasn't quite all there. He hadn't looked at the prototype himself in quite a while, I don't think. He offered to take a look at some point, but he was currently far away working on a project for his current venture, Ingenio. Anyway, that's kind of how I left it. I got into other projects while I waited. Weeks turned into months, months turned into years, and the just begun project languished on a shelf. I thought maybe this might be one I didn't finish, or even really truly get started. Then, one day on the VC Fed forum, I saw a post from Al Caso, who works for the Computer History Museum. He advised me that Bob Marsh had donated the prototype to the museum. Yes! Apparently he had tried to donate it some time before, but the museum hadn't picked up on it. Maybe my pestering about it had prompted him to try again? Anyway, I was immediately overjoyed because now I could get desperately needed measurements and hopefully see internal details that would guide me in building my own. I immediately reached out to staff, trying not to press my luck, but just asking if some pictures could be taken with a ruler or tape measure present. And as always, CHM staff were super helpful and agreed to do so. 
At last, I was finally going to be able to see modern, high-quality photos with a scale that I could use to model my replica from. On a parallel track, Al was also taking photos for the museum's own record, and he posted those on BitSavers. His photos included taking the machine apart to get really good photos of the internals, which really helped fill in some blanks. I felt like I had won the lottery. Anyway, let's have a look at Al's photos first, and then we can look at the scaled photos that were sent directly to me, and see if the cardboard prototype that I was building was on the right track. Wow, I gotta say, it really gives you a weird feeling when you've only seen something in grainy black and white magazine historical photos, and maybe a couple of low quality color ones to finally have pictures with modern equipment taken. Old photography, along with image resizing by the magazine, made accurately deducing dimensions almost impossible. But now here it was in living color and with a ruler thrown in for scale. CHM is awesome. I'm just in awe. Processor Technology is one of the legendary first generation microcomputer firms, and this is the very first Sol, the very thing I'd read about in ROM magazine and other publications, the product of all that blood, sweat, and tears decades ago. So similar to what would become the Sol 20, yet so different. I've always been fascinated by prototypes. I love vintage computers, but if I'm being honest, my real interest is history, and the history is primarily about people. A prototype of something like this brings you as close as you can get sometimes to the people themselves and their story. Lee Felsenstein and Bob Marsh may have interacted occasionally with production salt machines, but this was the thing they were burning the midnight oil to meet deadline on. I wouldn't be surprised if their literal fingerprints were still on parts of this thing. Okay, so right away we can clearly see the center cut walnut sides, which are stained just like the salt 20s. I'm not sure if this is a particular type or shade of walnut, Tree experts? Uh, yeah, let me know in the comments. Uh, walnut, of course, is very much in use today for hobbies, furniture, and so on, so getting pieces of that shouldn't be an issue. The only thing that might be a very trivial issue is that the walnut available in the 70s might be different from today's. I ran into this issue with my TV typewriter. I was having trouble figuring out exactly what kind of wood the sides were made of. I thought Douglas fir at first, and then I found oak to be more appropriate. However, I still had a lot of trouble matching the grain and such. I was told that this may be because the trees that were being cut down in the 70s were much more mature, whereas the trees today tend to be younger due to the exhaustion of older growth. I don't know how accurate that is, but it certainly sounds reasonable. We will have to just accept whatever the lumber gods gave us on this one. Next is the metal pan and frame that forms the structural chassis. This isn't anything too fancy, basically a sheet metal of certain gauge bent to shape, along with slanted metal brackets to mount the keyboard. This is stuff you can pick up at any Home Depot store. However, getting the metal is one thing, bending it to nice and square corners is a whole other undertaking, as I discovered with my TV typewriter. The TVT has a single piece of structural metal between the wood sides. It's fairly thin, and I thought it'd be no biggie to shape it as I liked, but wow, I was wrong. I mean, you can bend metal easily enough, but to get a nice, crisp 90 degree corner, you need something called a metal break for that. It's basically a really powerful clamp and it gives you a nice edge and the leverage to bend the metal cleanly against it. I didn't have one and went without, but found out the hard way that the sharper the corner you want, the harder it is physically to get it. I had to use a hammer and some clamps to kind of bang it into the shape I needed, and even then it didn't quite come out as I'd hoped but it's covered with faux leather, so at least I don't have to look at it. I think for the metal end of things, I'm gonna to have to go to a friend who has all the metal working equipment and tools. They manufacture wooden socks for airports, but generally can produce anything they want out of metal. I think contracting their help there will save me a lot of aggravation. Now, here's the keyboard, and indeed we can see, just like the one I have, it's a Keytronics unit. Processor technology stuck with the Keytronics for the Sol 20, although the keyboard for that machine was much larger and had a full number pad. Comparing it to the one I have, the PCB is noticeably different, but the keys and key switches do appear to be the same. Interestingly, on the back of the original keyboard, you can see another small proto board with an unidentifiable IC on it, and the rainbow ribbon cable going to the socket in the keyboard PCB. I'm guessing that something gets modified here and then the keyboard connects via a ribbon cable using this header here and then another somewhere on the mainboard. It's tempting to think about scavenging parts from my keyboard and trying to build a replica of the prototype keyboard's PCB, but I think there isn't nearly enough visible information here. I'd have to sit and reverse engineer a schematic. To do that, I'd need the original taken apart and I don't think even CHM is going to be willing to do that. So hopefully my keyword conforms to ASCII standards and I can just figure out a way to connect it. 
With the keyboard removed, we can see the infamous Sol Intelligent Terminal prototype PCB. No solder mask, unlike the later board, but it does look like it was tinned. I'm going to have to assume that the vias and IC pads were through plated also. The S100 connector, interestingly, is installed on the bottom side of the board. You can just barely make out the shadow of it here in this photograph. That tells me that the board shown in the magazine photograph here isn't the one in the prototype because it had the S100 connector up top. I'm not sure why the connector is on the bottom like this, but yeah, there it is. Not like you can install a card likely anyway. I don't think there's enough room in the case and I'm not sure that they got all the issues with the S100 slot worked out. It's been suggested to me that maybe this was intended just as a header to connect those external wires between this machine and the intended external S100 card cage down the road. I'm not really sure what this dial is for. It looks like a volume dial from a tape deck. Weird. We can see 25 pin ports for serial communications. I'm not sure if this one was for a printer maybe. And man, Lee Felsenstein wasn't kidding about all those bodge wires. It doesn't look quite as bad as I'd imagined, but uh, yeah, one thing we have to contend with is we don't know what they did with the underside of the board, which is not visible in the photos. And again, I highly doubt CHM would be willing to lift up the board for the purposes of photographing the other side. It'd just be too risky. Lee said that there were around 100 jumper wires that had to be installed to make this thing functional. So yeah, I can see quite a few topside, but uh, I bet there's a whole bunch underneath that I can't. Over here would have been an Intel or other branded 8080 CPU. We can see in photographs that it was a white ceramic, but yeah, it's not really clear which manufacturer made it. We can also see that it's been scavenged for some reason, probably because it was valuable and needed for something else. I'm assuming that happened after the Vintage Computer Festival demo, otherwise that could explain why it didn't work back then. I'm 99% sure Bob and Lee wouldn't have tried to run their device without it though. Up in the back right and still installed is the UART for serial communications. According to the popular electronics article, the prototype had 1280 bytes of RAM which seems kind of like an odd amount. Looking at the board itself, I only see four 2101 RAMs. These are 256 words, I think, by 4 bits wide, which if I recall correctly means each chip has 1024 bits, or 128 bytes, and you need a pair of them to make the full 8 bits, so that gives you 256 bytes per pair. So 4 would equal one half of a kilobyte. I wonder if the article writer got this wrong somehow. I don't see any other RAM on board. Oh wait, maybe they're counting the video and CPU RAM together? This was suggested to me on the VC Fed forum, and quite honestly, that's the only way I could see the RAM amounting to more than one kilobyte. I had completely forgotten about the video RAM. Duh. Although we can see here there are eight 2102s for the video RAM, so that plus a half kilobyte should be 1.5K, not 1.2. I'm not really sure, but I'm thinking maybe the article isn't accurately representing what was actually installed on this particular board. Anyway, you could expand the RAM out to the maximum 64K that an Intel 8080 could handle via the S100 connector at the back here. That's going to be a decision point possibly. Do I strictly follow the once working prototype board's design and leave it at that? Or do I go for the trophy and try to get the S100 slot working so that in my expanding alternate history universe, I can actually try using this future replica and making it more functional as a computer with more RAM? Over here we have the three EEPROMs that contain the firmware that drove this machine. These are 5204 EEPROMs, I think National was the original maker, which I believe store a half kilobyte of information each. The board has three of them installed, which I assume means there's 1.5 kilobytes of ROM available. Al Coso of CHM dumped these for posterity, but sadly one of the EEPROMs was physically damaged and yielded no data. And that's unfortunate because the data doesn't seem to be preserved anywhere else. This is probably why the prototype didn't work when it was demonstrated nearly 30 years ago. I did ask both Lee and Bob if the source code survived, or even if they remembered what exactly it did, but sadly they didn't recall. Al's post suggested that the broken EEPROM window might have taken out some of the tiny wires or links inside. Maybe the code was still there, but uh, yeah, that seemed to kind of imply it could be repaired, although I'm not sure how or if that's possible or even when that might take place. For now, sadly, that code is basically lost. In the surviving code though, there are some tantalizing clues as to what it did. We can see something that says, <laughs> yes master is finished master. We also see what looks like the beginnings of a demonstration program. Processor Technology Corp presents Sol, the intelligent terminal. This doesn't match what's on screen in the article pictures, but maybe that text was typed in in terminal mode or just faked. Or maybe it existed in the missing EEPROM contents. 
I've asked those more experienced than me to look at the code and advise what they thought it did. My VC friend Dave looked at the code and said it looked like on execution it basically jumped to the now dead EEPROM immediately, so yeah, of course it would. That said, I feel like based on some of the ASCII text seen here that it could have had at least some terminal functionality and that would have been available for demonstration purposes. Dave thinks he can spot four distinct commands, including term, edit, rect, and line. He couldn't tell me if any of these actually did anything since they seem to point to the now missing code in that third EEPROM. It's possible they're just for show, but there also might be just enough code to make this thing work as a terminal or just allow for some screen editing. Since the Sol Intelligent Terminal was, as the name implied, being offered as a terminal at this point, I doubt there was anything in the way of a system monitor or tools for programming that would have been more relevant to a general purpose computer. It just doesn't seem like there'd be enough room in the remaining 0.5 kilobytes to do all that. Personally, I'm doubtful this machine did much at all. This may well have been a digital Potemkin village designed to excite the reader with possibility when in fact the machine itself could do very little more than display inviting text touting what it could do. We may never be able to answer the question on that one, but maybe I can dedicate myself to figuring out as much as I can about the code and reconstruct something. Assuming I get there, of course, a challenge I face is programming those MM5204s, which aren't supported by my GQ4X4 or most modern EEPROM burners. Like the Intel 1702, it's a bit of an odd beast and requires something like 60 volts, I think, for programming. I'm told there was a very excellent programmer made by Martin Eberhard of Tesla fame, but I don't think it's available at the moment. I had thought of setting up this machine with Sol OS or console, which were the ROM monitors offered for the Sol 20. If I understand my processor technology history correctly, the very first monitor ROM for the Sol terminal computer was console. It was a very minimal system monitor or operating system in the parlance of its day. Console had some tape routines but could only load from tape and not save? Weird. Sol OS is the better known operating system most often used on the Sol 20. It's more full featured with options to save and load from cassette as well as better terminal functions. But after consulting with Dave from VCFed, it seems like it may be a bit too much for this limited prototype design and wouldn't fit on the EEPROMs that are available. Dave has very graciously volunteered to modify the console code to work with the intelligent terminal we're going to build here. So we are kind of venturing into alternate history since this machine never really made it to the next step of functionality as a computer. This should be really interesting. From what I understand, in console, things like the display and keyword routines need to be modified because the locations and or particulars of those resources were changed significantly on the Sol 20, which is what console was originally programmed for. Anyway, that's an exciting development. All right, well, that's a good bit of talking. Let's take a few baby steps in doing. So here's my hastily constructed cardboard model. Now that we've got the photographs with actual measurement scale available, just for fun, let's see how close my estimations got. Okay, so here's my hastily constructed cardboard model of the Sol prototype. And uh, yeah, as you can see with most things that are hastily built, it's uh, not holding together too well. <laughs> it's uh, been sitting on a shelf for a couple of years and unfortunately things were kind of being piled on top of it or banged onto it. It's got a really nice layer of dust up there and the paint is flaking off. But uh, yeah, this is what I put together. This is the first time I ever tried to build any kind of model whatsoever. And it was just because at the time, uh, the prototype hadn't been donated to Computer History Museum yet. And all I had to work with were the original pictures in the magazine article, which had been retouched and stretched or shrunk in order to fit uh, onto the page in the way that the editors wanted. So, you know, I was lucky in that I had the keyboard, so I had something that allowed me to roughly scale things against these pictures, but because I can't trust that these dimensions have been kept proportionate, um, you know, I, I basically have to kind of eyeball it. So I figured if I built a cardboard prototype of the prototype, that would get me uh, something that I could compare to and then say, you know, okay, that, that looks right or that doesn't look right. Uh, you know, I need to adjust that. The keyboard's too far out, too high, etc., etc. I actually think I got it pretty close, but let's just see. Now, again, the pictures that I got from Computer History Museum, the, the placement of the ruler, unfortunately, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what it's lining up to. Uh, you know, the perspective is just slightly off. 
So there's places where, you know, it looks like the whole thing is only like, you know, 15 inches across and then other places it looks like it's more like 24 inches. But I think I've got it right here. Um, based on looking at several of the photos, I guess that the machine was about 20 to 21 inches wide. So let's see how I did. Yeah, I, I feel like 20 to 21 is pretty darn close. I think 20 is pretty much right there. Um, you can see in the original photo, there is uh, a significant gap between the side and the keyboard. Maybe a tiny bit more than what I've got here. And then the cassette deck, as confirmed in the newest photos, uh, seems to be basically up against uh, the wood on that side. I think I'm in the right zone. Um, I might want to take it out to 21 inches just to be safe, but I think that's okay. In terms of the front side, I wasn't really able to get a good fix on how tall that is. But if we look at the side here, um, I guesstimated based on photographs, and I have no idea how I did this, that it was about five inches tall at the back. And look at that. And that's exactly more or less what the photograph seems to be suggesting. So yeah, I must be pretty good at estimating stuff. Uh, you know, I have uh, another hobby in model railroading and I'm kind of used to trying to scale things from not so great photographs. So um, between the original photograph that I was working with and literally all I scaled it from was this. Uh, and then later the other one. Yeah, I think I did all right. Okay, and that's where I think I'll leave it for now as this video is getting kind of long. But don't worry, there'll be one more coming shortly where I rebuild my model once again in box form, this time better informed by pictures that provide an actual scale. After that, future videos will depend on things like acquiring parts, doing research, and so on. I don't know how many videos this series will ultimately be, but I guess at least six of them just based on what I have in my head. Anyhow, that's it for this episode. See you shortly in part three. And as always, thanks so much for watching.